All right, welcome to today's lesson on advanced flowcharting, where we're going to take a look at how to use selection structures in the flowcharts that we create. So if we remember from a couple weeks ago when we first started flowcharting, we know that flowcharts are used to give a graphical representation of what our code is going to look like. They can be written down and then converted into any programming language that we want. And they use a number of different simple signs. So we have an oval that represents the starting and ending of a program. We have an arrow that shows us the flow or direction that our code is going to follow. We have a rectangle that shows us any kind of process or calculation that we might perform. And then we have a parallelogram that can be used to show input and output that our code does. Now these simple flowcharts that we've done so far work really well for programs that follow its code in a step-by-step -step process, doing one thing then the other until we get to the end of the program. But sometimes we're going to incorporate, uh, we're going to have programs that we have a question. We have multiple options that we can perform. So you're going to do one thing or you're going to do another thing. And how can our code and our flowcharts showcase that? So we do that by using what we call selection structures. This is a point in the program where two values are compared and then something's done based upon those comparisons. So for example, maybe I have a program where I ask the user their age, and if they're over the age of 16, they can be allowed to drive a car. Whereas if they're not over the age of 16, they're not allowed to drive a car, right? Um, that comparison I, I made there is a true or false answer, right? Either you are over 18, true, or over 16, true, or you are not over 16, which is false. In flowcharts, we use a simple shape like a diamond to show um, selection structures, show options in our code. And we always have one arrow coming into that diamond, then we have the question that we're asking, and then we have the true or false response coming out. So now our program can either go this direction if that statement's true, or it could go this direction down here if that statement is false. So let's show an example of what that might look like. Let's say I need to do a program where I'm going to check if the user is old enough to get a license like I talked about earlier. So I would start, I would then input the user's age, and then I would compare. Is the age over 15? In other words, are they 16 or older? And if that's true, I'm going to follow this fork, where I'm going to output that they can drive and then end my program. If that statement is false and they're under the age of 15, I'm going to output that they are too young and then also follow along and eventually go to this end statement. Okay, let's try a little, another example where we have more than just one option. So we're going to compare two numbers to find the larger number. I input the first number, I input the second number, and then I'm going to check. Is the first number bigger than the second number? And if it is true, then I can output that number one is larger. If it's false, I have another question to ask, right? Is the number less than number one less than number two? If it is less than, then I can output number two is larger. And otherwise, if it's not greater than and it's not less than, the only other option I have is that it's false. In this case, they are equal and I output that. So you can see here I just keep doing a series of true, false, true, false, true, false until I get through all of the options that I can come up with. That's it. That's all we have time for today. We'll see you in class tomorrow where we can practice what we've learned.